Hello, and welcome to Top Story Daily Edition. I'm JNS Editor-in-Chief Jonathan Tobin. Thanks for joining me for a discussion on the most pressing issues in the Jewish world. Please like, subscribe, and give us good reviews when you listen to the show. Now let's get started. Can you oppose anti-Semitism while at the same time make common cause with Jew haters, their organizations, and the ideas that propel them forward? The answer from the Biden administration and their allies that control the legacy organizations that purport to speak for American Jewry is yes. That is a point that has been repeatedly made clear in recent weeks, as once again the political left has shown itself incapable of responding to the growing problem of anti-Semitism without seeking to give a pass to their ideological allies. The same forces unfairly seek to connect the dots between mainstream conservatives and marginal extremists on the far right that are anti-Semitic and to which they have no ties or affinity. But they are guilty of doing the same thing themselves. One of the best examples of this came from the person who holds the federal position that is actually tasked with fighting anti-Semitism. Ambassador Deborah Lipstadt, the U.S. State Department's special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. Lipstadt has been spending a lot of time lately defending the Biden administration's recent national strategy to combat anti-Semitism. That document was lauded by most of the organized Jewish world because, at least in principle, It represented a commitment to fighting all forms of Jew hatred, no matter the origins. But when asked about why the administration included the Council of American Islamic Relations, or CARE, in the document, allowing a group that is itself helping to spread Jew hatred in the Muslim community, Lipstadt responded with a figurative shrug of the shoulders. Ignoring the reality of CARE's contemporary behavior, as well as downplaying its past record, the historian-turned-Biden administration apologist said that Jews were obligated to give even those rabid Jew haters a second chance. Jews come from, quote, a tradition that believes in forgiveness. Our holiest days of the year are about change. So if they're really willing to change, if they're really willing to say, hey, now we see this is a serious problem, then they are will- welcome, close quote. Lipstadt, who shredded her credibility but earned the nomination to her prestigious post by supporting the outrageous claim by Democrats that the Trump administration and the Republicans were analogous to the Nazis, left an important element out of her lame rationalization for CARE's inclusion. The administration sees the radical group, which only this week defended Hamas against Israeli incursions into Janine were against terrorists. They defended it because it fits in with their intersectional mindset in which so-called victim groups can do no wrong, even if they are open Jew haters. Of course, Lipstadt's rationalization and the White House largely meaningless strategy paper are small potatoes compared to the Biden administration's decision to rejoin UNESCO, the UN Cultural Organization. Like the rest of the world body's many agencies, UNESCO is an important source of anti-Semitism, using its prestige and influence to deny Jewish history and slander Israel, such as its outrageous claim that the Tomb of the Patriarchs in Hebron is an endangered Muslim site. The government is compelled by U.S. law to defund UNESCO because of its recognition of Palestine as a member state, an attempt to make an end run around the peace process whose goal is to delegitimize Israel. But a Biden administration that is besotted with the United Nations has been itching to rejoin UNESCO, with Secretary of State Antony Blinken claiming that it's necessary in order for the United States to compete there with its global rival China. Now, that's pretty rich considering that Blinken made that statement during the course of a visit to Beijing in which he allowed himself to be repeatedly insulted and then kowtowed to the communist regime's ambition to conquer Taiwan. But while Americans have come to expect that sort of behavior from Blinken, the UNESCO decision could have been a moment for Lipstadt to demonstrate her independence by publicly protesting or resigning. 
Yet having already sacrificed so much for the privilege of being called ambassador for the rest of her days, she clearly saw no reason to make a stand that might upset or undermine her political masters. And so, it's difficult to blame the Biden administration for its refusal to stand up to left-wing anti-Semites when the official Jewish community is doing the same thing. That was demonstrated again last month when both the Jewish Federations of North America, or JFNA, and the Jewish Council for Public Affairs, or JCPA, pulled out of the Combat Anti-Semitism Coalition over that organization's video that directly linked wokeism and the hard left's ideologies like intersectionality and critical race theory, or CRT, to Jew hatred. Unlike most of the legacy Jewish groups, Combat Antisemitism is a genuinely nonpartisan group that seeks to unite Jews from all ends of the political spectrum in the fight against hate. It has done exemplary work standing up to the BDS movement and pushed hard for the adoption of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, or IHRA's working definition of antisemitism, despite pushback from the anti-Israel left which seeks to leave the war against Israel and Zionism out of that struggle. The video in question sought to highlight a basic fact of contemporary American life. The progressive left's adherence to the ideas behind the woke catechism of diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, are, despite their anodyne-sounding words, a permission slip for anti-Semitism. Equity is a demand not for the equality of opportunity that is enabled American Jewry to thrive, but for equality of outcomes. That means quotas and the enshrinement of racial discrimination in perpetuity. The goal of the woke movement is not so much to claim that a colorblind society is unattainable, but that it is undesirable. Steeped as it is in toxic theories about white privilege, advocates for DEI, who have conquered academia, the corporate world, and now the Biden administration, label both Jews and Israel as white. In their worldview, individuals are divided into two groups, oppressors and people of color, who are oppressed, with Jews on the wrong side of the line. In this way, both CRT and DEI legitimize the myth that the Palestinian war on Zionism is analogous to the struggle for civil rights in the United States. Far from being an academic argument, the progressive belief has enabled anti-Semitic attacks on Israel's existence and Jewish rights not merely to thrive, but to be mainstreamed in American political discourse. While right-wing anti-Semites are confined to the fever swamps of political life, left-wing Jew haters are no longer marginalized. Instead, they are granted a hearing on the op-ed pages of like the publications like the New York Times, and as the careers of Representatives Ilhan Omar and Rashid Tlaib and other squad members have illustrated, become a rising force within the Democratic Party. Yet for both the federations represented by JFNA and the community relations councils fronted by JCPA, admitting this is a bridge too far. They're willing to mouth sentiments about opposing all forms of anti-Semitism, but when it comes to calling out their political allies on the left, especially in minority communities and the anti-Semitic Black Lives Matter movement, they want no part of it. As a result, they've ditched the Combat Anti-Semitism Coalition, depriving it of exactly the kind of mainstream liberal support that made it so effective. The decision is disgraceful, but was inevitable given the drift to the left in these groups that was epitomized by the selection of Amy Spitalnik, a veteran left-wing political hack, as the head of the JCPA. Vitalnik's elevation seemed to indicate that her group would fight hard to advance the partisan progressive agenda of the left and deprioritize the best interests of the Jewish people. And now this proves that such predictions were prescient. This is but one more example of the failure of the Jewish establishment in this country. While federations still do essential work in local communities and community relations councils have an important job to do, the umbrella groups representing them have shown themselves, and not for the first time, to be more comfortable in the role of auxiliary Democratic Party front groups than in standing up for the interests of the Jewish people in the United States or in Israel. The majority of American Jews who are politically liberal and loyal Democratic voters are uncomfortable with confronting the truth about both these Jewish groups and President Joe Biden. Still, 
whether they like it or not. An administration that has embraced DEI, included care in its anti-Semitism document, and rejoined UNESCO has shown that far from fighting the anti-Semites, it is allied with them. The same is now sadly true of JFNA and JCPA. As such, as most Jews would prefer to ignore these truths and avoid drawing conclusions from these dismal developments that explain why anti-Semitism is both growing and being mainstreamed by the political left, they can't pretend they haven't been warned. Thanks for listening. Please remember to tune in every day for Top Story Daily Edition and every week for the full hour-long JNS TV program. Whether you're listening to us on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, or any of the other podcast platforms, or on JNS's YouTube channel, please like and or subscribe to Top Story, click on the bell for notifications, and give us good reviews. Please write to us at editor at JNS.org and let us know where you listen or watch the show and what you think about. And remember, keep reading and thinking for yourself.